Welcome. This week we begin our discussion of the French Empire. The French, hmm, the verb is tricky actually. Control, dominate, uh, it's hard to say exactly what they do, but they certainly are the major political presence in northeastern North America um, for the 17th and the first half of the 18th century. Uh, they control the territory of modern Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, into Quebec, much of Ontario, and much of the central United States as well. Um, but control is it's, it's a tricky word, as we'll see in the next few minutes, um, because as, and as this map you're seeing right now <clears throat> indicates that yellow area is labeled as New France. But as we'll see, their, their actual presence on the ground uh, is much less significant than that map would, would indicate. We're going to look at a number of topics here today, and we're going to look at them quickly, uh, but we'll set up the topic in a general sense. We're going to look at New France as a commercial colony, and again, that, that, that adjective is important. Uh, the, the British colonies to the south and what becomes the United States are largely settler colonies. They're driven, or, driven by a settler population. Uh, this is a commercial colony where settlement is not nearly so much an, an issue. Uh, and that means that over the long term, uh, the French impact, the French presence in North America will be smaller. And that, will, that, that different demography from the British colonies will be significant later down the road. Look at relations with Indigenous peoples. Um, we'll be focusing on two groups here. We'll be looking at the, the Montagnais and the Ottawa uh, north of the St. Lawrence River. Uh, and we'll be looking at the Iroquois south of the, of the uh, St. Lawrence River. And we'll also spend some time, uh, not in this video, but in our next video, uh, on the Huron, who are uh, obviously near what we now call Lake Huron, but to, in what is now Western Ontario. So we'll look at uh, New France as a commercial colony, we'll look at indigenous relations, and we'll look at trade and missionaries and their role uh, in new, early New France society. Really quick look at uh, kind of New France in the middle of the 17th century, much like the map I just showed you at the beginning, shows a pretty big swath of territory. Uh, but, but point out, you know, that there are settlements in Acadia, modern day Nova Scotia. Uh, there's one noted there in Gaspé. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a Recollet uh, missionary. Uh, and then you see places, Tabasac, Quebec, Trois-Rivières, Ville-Marie, Ville which is Montreal. Uh, and that really does point to the, the notable settlements of, of any sort in New France. So the rest of this map is really area that they control by trade, which is to say that the dominant economic players of the fur trade in that area. So they have strong relations with, relationships with indigenous people through trade through that area. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. That territory will expand over the next hundred years to reach all the way south down to the Gulf of Mexico. They will again extend that trade network into the Mississippi River Valley uh, and dominate much of the indigenous uh, trade in that whole territory uh, well into the 18th century. And, and that will we'll pick up that story as part of the Seven Years' War, which will kind of transition us into the British period later. I want to tell you a little quick story here to give you some sense of kind of what a slow, protracted story this is, but also to link into our earlier discussion uh, about, uh, about uh, Indigenous history and how Europeans were walking into Indigenous history. This is the route of Jacques Cartier, who uh, explores uh, the Gulf of St. Lawrence in 1534. Cartier is often held up to be the, the father of New France, the, 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 the earliest explorer figure uh, in establishing uh, a French presence in North America. And that's certainly true in, in, in one sense. Certainly he's the first of the king's representatives to explore the area. He's there officially. He's not just kind of there as we, we, we saw in our introductory lecture that fishing people may well have been in this territory. Um, he's not there just as a fishing person. He's there to map. He's there to, to, uh, to provide uh, knowledge of what possibilities might exist for the French in this new territory. What I want you to see, though, is this route he takes. And, and notice that he goes by Prince Edward Island. He goes by the western end of Prince Edward Island. And then he goes up along the Gaspé. He records all this in his report. Uh, and when he gets to the Gaspé, uh, sorry, when he gets to Prince Edward Island, um, he stays there overnight. He anchors his ship there overnight. And when he comes out in the morning, there are indigenous people on the beach uh, waving uh, furs on sticks to him. And they, they clearly want to trade. Uh, and that's really interesting because if he's the first uh, European vessel they've seen, they certainly don't seem intimidated by him. Uh, and in fact, they even seem to think, oh, he probably wants to trade. And given, again, the, the kind of notion that he must be strange, that seems a bit odd. But of course, he's not strange. Well, he might be strange. 
but he's not the first European to show up on these waters. Um, there have been a Basque, French, Irish, English fishermen uh, fishing in this area for 30, 40, 50 years at this point in time. Um, and so he's just another boat passing by, but they know he's probably interested in trade. He does trade with them. He talks to them. They, they can't talk. They don't speak the same language, but they, you know, they engage in some sort of communication. Um, he figures out something, which is that he understands them to be saying that they seem to be at war with another group of people to the north, because he's going to go up to the north. And they're not happy about that. They don't want him to go there. Um, and so the next day, he actually does that. He sails up along the eastern coast of New Brunswick to the north, uh, gets to the Gas Bay, where he meets other indigenous people. And they're not the same indigenous people. Um, in fact, we now know they they were Iroquoian peoples. And in fact, much as the Mi'kmaq had said, they were, on, they were a raiding party on their way south to attack the Mi'kmaq. Now, maybe not those people in PEI, but somebody in eastern New Brunswick or somewhere in that territory. That's really, really interesting because it points us to that kind of existence of ongoing stories. And we now know from oral history, we now know from archaeological evidence, we now know from little snippets of evidence like Cartier gives us, uh, that that war had been going on for quite some time. In fact, what was really happening was a battle between a group of Algonquian peoples, including the Mi'kmaq, including the Abenaki, including the Maliseet, including the Montanay, against the Iroquois. And they're trying to push them back down uh, the St. Lawrence River Valley. And this is kind of part of that war. So this is 1534 that this is taking part, taking place. The next year, uh, Cartier sails back down the river, uh, comes, comes back from France, sails down the, the Gulf of St. Lawrence again. This time it goes all the way down the river. Uh, explores some uh, some Iroquoian villages, one at Hochelaga, uh, which is modern-day Montreal, and one at Staticona, modern-day Quebec. And he documents this for us and describes it in, in some detail in his voyages. That's interesting because it shows us kind of an Iroquoian presence there, and it shows us kind of this early moment of early contact between Cartier uh, and the French in general and indigenous people. What's interesting, though, is nothing really comes of this. The French do not pick up serious colonization efforts at that point in time. Uh, it was an exploratory mission. He was meant to come back uh, describing the wealth and possibilities that existed there, but he didn't. Uh, there's fish, there's furs, there's things like that. But they were really kind of imagining gold and diamonds more than fish and furs. Fish and furs are valuable. We'll be talking about that as we go. Uh, but they're not gold and diamonds. And this is kind of the, the more fanciful notion of what might be found here. And of course, that's what the Spanish and the Portuguese were finding in, in Mexico and South America. 75 years later, Samuel de Champlain uh, sets up a camp under, the French, under French leadership again uh, in modern-day Nova Scotia at a place called Port Royal in 1604. Um, this will be the beginnings of a new French colony called Acadia, Acadie, uh, and it will be Mm, slow in its successes. It'll grow very, very gradually. It'll be the 1650s, 1660s before we see more than three or 400 people there. Uh, but this is the beginnings of its, of its establishment here in 1604. And this really marks the beginning uh, of a French presence uh, in North America. Um, this is uh, the, the habitation they, they build at Port Royal uh, in 1604, 1605. It's a fairly large structure. It was meant to be both a housing and, and a military defense because they really weren't sure, of course, what the relation is with the local indigenous people. Those relations turned out to be quite good, um, but they you know, didn't know that at the beginning. And they were certainly aware of other uh, European parties who might be a threat as well, um, English raiders and, and privateers of, of various sorts who might be in those Atlantic waters. Um, this also begins the process of bringing uh, missionaries uh, into this territory. Um, as part of the financing of these operations, some aristocrats in France uh, would offer to invest in these companies, but oftentimes would insist that they private, these are private companies, um, that they would insist that the companies uh, bring along missionaries uh, to proselytize, to, to bring the, the Catholic Christian faith uh, to the indigenous people of the territory. Uh, and so you can see uh, there are Jesuits in Acadia from 1608 to 1613, not a long period of time, but they have some, some, some successes there. Uh, there's some political disputes between these different religious orders in France. You can see the Recollet take over in 1615 and then return again in the 1650s. And the Jesuits return again after 1625. And they're going to be a presence and we'll be talking a little bit more about them later. But they're really established here in this time period. 
Four years later, Champlain, um, seeing some possibilities in Acadie, but also seeing bigger possibilities down that big river, the St. Lawrence River, um, sends, sends a, sorry, not sends, leads a small uh, expedition up to uh, modern day Quebec uh, and begil, begins to build uh, a habitation there, much like they had built at Port Royal. And this is a, a drawing from it, from his 1612 uh, illustrated book. Um, it's, a, a, again, a fairly substantial building and complex and so on. But again, we're talking about a couple dozen uh, men manning it. Champlain spends his next few years exploring the territory, establishing relationships with indigenous people, trading relationships, trying to see what's there to be traded. This map is a nice illustration of this, both as, as a map in and of itself, but also, of course, shows some of the indigenous people or representations of them anyhow, uh, but also some of the resources that are available, some of the fruits and vegetables, um, some of the some of the plants that grow in the area, medicinal plants, uh, foods, seafoods, uh, and, and fur-bearing animals, and other just possible resources like that. So this is really kind of a, uh, a listing of potential things that can be exploited uh, in the New World. He also establishes a pattern of his relationships with Indigenous people. In particular, uh, he discovers that uh, that the, the the Indigenous people of the area are largely of one related group of people. They're all Algonquian people. Now for us, this might strike us as an interesting moment because we know that when Cartier went down the St. Lawrence River in that, in that uh, 75 years earlier, he had seen Iroquoian peoples there. And that relates directly to that story that, that we were talking about earlier, uh, where Cartier encounters these people in warfare. The Algonquians, it appears, have driven the Iroquoians out of the St. Lawrence River Valley. There are no longer Iroquoian peoples right in that valley settlement area. Stadacona is abandoned, Hochelaga is abandoned. They're no longer there as Iroquoian uh, towns and settlements. So again, that, that we see that, that story of, of an indigenous history playing out on the ground that the Europeans are largely there as observers of. The observer status will change dramatically over a long period of time, um, and in some ways in significant fashions in fairly short periods of time as well. One of the first of these occurs in 1609. Champlain, um, in currying the relationships with the indigenous people in the area, wants to explore further to the south, and that's where the Iroquoian people lives. And the Algonquian people are not happy about this, but they also see a possibility here of enlisting uh, Champlain as an ally in their struggles with the Iroquoian people. So in the spring of 1609, they sailed down uh, a river which will, which will become the, will come to be named the, the, the Richelieu River, which will, sh um, which will uh, connect with Lake Champlain, a lake that uh, connects uh, Quebec and Ontario, uh, sorry, Quebec and uh, New York State uh, today. They'll sail down that river, and sure enough, at the end of that river, uh, when they get to the lake, they get to uh, some, some, some local, we're not exactly sure where they end up. We, we, we'll describe it uh, some places as uh, Ticonderoga, but some people dispute that, that location, but anywhere near the head of the lake. And they find, sure enough, there are Iroquoian people there. Um, and a day after arriving at that area, um, an actual battle breaks out. And the battle is a remarkable moment in settler indigenous relations. The Iroquois, while they've been driven back here, uh, certainly were an expansionary uh, and successful military diplomatic peoples. Um, but certainly the Algonquians wished to push them back even further uh, into, into, back into Iroquoian territory. When the battle breaks out, uh, Champlain is able to bring along some of his French weapons. In particular, he's able to bring along uh, some French guns. And by modern standards, these are not impressive guns. They're really kind of small cannons. Their accuracy isn't particularly good, uh, but they're powerful. Uh, and at close range, they can kill people. Uh, and that's exactly what happens. Champlain fires his gun. Some of his men fire their guns. Uh, and they kill at least two of the Iroquoian leaders in the initial charge in the first minutes of the battle. The Iroquois have never seen this before. Uh, it's the first time they've encountered um, uh, gunpowder weapons before. Uh, and so they, they, they're, they're, they're taken aback by this, they don't understand this, and they, they certainly retreat at this moment. It's a decisive victory for uh, the Algonquian peoples. And of course, it will set a pattern uh, for ongoing relations between the French uh, and indigenous people in the area. They will be allies of the Algonquians, they will be enemies of the Iroquois. 
And it won't be till 1701, almost a century later, uh, that a significant peace will be established between the French and the Iroquois. And we'll, we'll, we'll pick that story up later. The story of New France is a slow and protracted story. There's not a lot of money being invested here. Uh, in 1627, a new company is formed come, called the Company of 100 Associates. They begin to put some money into the, into, the, uh, into, the, into the firm, into the area, but still not a whole lot of money. The fur trade is developing, the missionary activity is developing, but it's slow, it's gradual, the profits aren't that great, uh, and very few settlers moving into the area. We're talking about a couple hundred people uh, in, the six, in the 1620s. Some of the strongest relations established in this time period are being established by the, the missionaries. Um, most of them Jesuits. Uh, they are active in Acadia, uh, they're active in New France, they're active uh, particularly among the Huron uh, in what's now Western Ontario. These are controversial and complex relations. Um, certainly today we, te <clears throat> we tend to view them as a kind of cultural assimilation, a kind of, a kind of cultural genocide in some people's terminology. Um, Certainly they didn't view it in those terms. Certainly they viewed it as, as bringing uh, salvation uh, to, to people who did not know uh, a true religion. Um, but what does come out of this are some strengthened relations and what you can call kind of a cultural cement uh, that was added on to the trade relationship, that was added on to the military relationship. So it was another kind of dimension to the, to the, to the whole story. Um, that we'll, we'll pick up a little bit more of this in some of our later discussions, but it's certainly important to see that this is a general dimension of, of the ongoing French indigenous relationship. And it's also linked to the fur trade because that's how these guys get out into that country. Uh, they're carried out on fur trade vessels. Uh, they establish connections with these people. And the people they establish connections with are largely ones who are interested in participating in the fur trade. So for example, uh, this is uh, Jean de Brebeuf, who you can see does not fare well uh, as a missionary, he's, he's martyred uh, in 1648. And we'll come back to that story later as well. Um, but what you do know, need to know is that he's out there working among the Huron, the Wendat people. Uh, and um, it's precisely because the Huron, Wendat people have become important players in the fur trade that he's there. It's become a center in kind of French indigenous relations on a trade basis, and it will also become one on a religious basis. So these things are kind of two sides of a, of a single coin. Throughout this time period, a whole complex series of wars breaks out, the Iroquois Wars, the Abenaki Wars, the Fox Wars, all throughout the 17th and early 18th centuries. These are complex. They relate to various different alliances formed between the British, the French, the Dutch for a time. Uh, and the Iroquois are largely in the middle as the largest single indigenous group, certainly on the ground militarily a comparable force, in many cases much stronger force than the French and the British, uh, and certainly trying to play a kind of, uh, a kind of buffer role uh, between them, trying to control their own territory, trying to play the British and the French off of each other, uh, using diplomacy and warfare as part of that. But it's all linked to the fur trade, it's all linked to kind of expansionary pressures, both in the British colonies in the modern day United States and the French colonies in modern day Canada. We won't spend much more time talking about this, but it is important to know that along that buffer zone, uh, there's a kind of, I wouldn't say a constant state of warfare, but it's certainly a regular feature uh, of life in that area. So we kind of need to look at this and say, well, there's not many settlers there. Uh, they're expanding through trade. They've got some missionaries there and so on. So is this actually, in fact, a French territory? Um, and I'm just giving you this little close up of a map here, which you know, this is not a, a map that represents territory that people at the time would have actually identified in this, this kind of fashion. But you can certainly see there's the, you know, the, uh, uh, the ancient country of the Utue, there's the, the, la the land of the Iroquois of the north. Um, and the French may be claiming, I can see the Abenaki there in the, in the, uh, in the lower right. Um, and so you can certainly get a sense that, that from, even on this French map, uh, that it's largely dominated by indigenous people. Uh, that they are the ones who occupy most of the space. They still control the territory uh, in a significant fashion. They still have great autonomy uh, in their own lives. So how did the French find stability in this situation? Well, largely through trade. Um, this is, uh, <laughs> I assure you, most indigenous people brought more than one skin to a fur trade exchange. Uh, they would usually bring hundreds. Um, but this is just a nice little illustration that's found uh, on an 18th century map. Um, but it does give you that nice sense of, of, of trade and the fur trade and how it worked out. 
Um, certainly for the French, it was important and powerful. It meant that they established good relationships with people. If both people, people found benefit through this trade, and certainly indigenous people calculated in their own interests that they were receiving something valuable, uh, and the French people calculated that they were receiving something valuable, that's what, make trades, that's what makes trade work, and that will encourage stability. Uh, so whatever hostilities might have existed amongst these people, whatever suspicions might have existed amongst these people, uh, certainly trade provided uh, a, a kind of uh, a sweetener uh, uh, for, for the relationship. They also found stability through alliances. Um, the Iroquois consistently aligned with the British and the Dutch to the south, the Algonquians to the west and the north consistently aligned with the French. And that gave the French a good, strong footing on the ground. It, it, and, and it's very, very closely linked with the fur trade. Uh, it's very closely linked with the relationships established in the fur trade, again, of mutual benefit. And again, in the long term, people say, well, did indigenous people benefit equally? In the long term, no. But in the short term, they're making a calculation that they are receiving benefits that they find acceptable in those terms. Uh, which is not to say that they you know, somehow agree to the larger patterns of history. They didn't. They, they were agreeing, to, agreeing to, to, uh, to uh, trade issues on the ground, very, fairly simple matters. Uh, in the long term, it wasn't the right course, but they couldn't possibly have known that. They also found stability through the missionaries. And this is probably the least uh, important one for the longer term, um, but more in the East, particularly in Nova Scotia, modern day uh, St. Lawrence River Valley, again, right in that kind of Quebec, Montreal corridor, uh, there's, there's pretty strong conversion rates among, uh, among indigenous people. Um, significant numbers do convert to Catholicism. And that, again, that provides a kind of glue uh, between the indigenous people uh, and the French missionaries. Final thing we can look at in this discussion is um, these books. So the Jesuits are by far the most famous missionary group in the world. They, they're, they're a powerful group. Uh, they, they are active in in South America, they're active in Japan, they're active in Africa, they're active in Asia, they're act active in, in North America. Um, and they're influential, they run universities, and they're, they're, they're significant uh, religious political figures uh, in, in Europe. Part of the reason they're able to do this is that they're pretty good at marketing themselves, at selling themselves, at raising money. And one of the ways they do this is with these books, the Jesuit Relations. So you can see that this is where they relate tales, relations, relate tales of, of, of their activities. And of course, their activities are on the one hand kind of spectacular and interesting, these, these unknown people off to the West and telling these strange tales about strange people. So it's kind of um, selling a kind of exotic story from, from, a, from an unknown land, uh, but also doing so in the name of Christ. So there's this uh, dimension of, of martyrdom and sacrifice and, and working for uh, not only for the French Empire or the Spanish Empire, uh, but also working for, for the Catholic Church and the, and the Kingdom of God. Uh, so th there's, there's a lot to be sold here. They sell, they, so when the, when the Jesuits, um, sometimes when they return, but sometimes they send these back from the New World, but when they return to France, um, they'll write these accounts of what they did. And they're really remarkable accounts. They're detailed, uh, they tell really interesting stories, uh, and they dis they're, they're are by far our best first-hand accounts of the relationships between indigenous people uh, and these colonizers. They're problematic in all kinds of ways. They're certainly deeply biased. They're certainly deeply influenced by the prejudices uh, that the Jesuits would bring to these, to, these, uh, to these situations. But the Jesuits are also highly educated men who have, and this is really important, who have a real interest in understanding the people they're trying to convert. In other words, they're not just trying to kind of take advantage of these people and say, you must convert because we know the truth. Of course, they, they, they do want them to convert, but they want them to understand why they're converting. They want them to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's really, really important. So it becomes very important for them to understand the cultures that they're dealing with. So they try really, really hard. And we can read it today and say, you know, they were failing in kinds of obvious ways. But they were trying, and they're trying very, very clearly uh, to describe these things accurately and effectively because they know that their success relies on having good understandings of these people. So these are really, really interesting accounts. And read critically um, today, 
Uh, they provide interesting insights into this relationship. Uh, they're without, and you'll be reading uh, excerpts from some of these in your readings in the next couple of weeks. These are really, really important documents. Useful, need to be read critically. We need to understand the context within which they were written, but read critically, read thoughtfully. Uh, they are really interesting documents that can tell us a lot uh, of what's going on.